morning. <laughs> I um, felt prompt and prompted to share a devotion from this week. I was finding myself feeling discouraged with the way things are going in the world and, of course, in this country. And with, with my friends and every one of us are aging and things are hurting that didn't used to and memories are fading that weren't. And anyhow, <coughs> the devotion was uh, Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I found a lot of strength in that. And then I likened it to what Paul Paul often referred to as running a race. I, uh, I did track in high school, and uh, I was so lucky to be placed as the anchor man on a, on a mile relay. And uh, often I had about 50 yards to make up by the time I got the baton. Well, a lot of times our visiting school or the school we visited would be um, right in there close with points so we needed the we needed those points so i give it what i could so in life we have this race to run. And we have to remember that there's a whole bunch of people waiting just over the finish line, cheering for us. Like Lowell and Jerry, Marianne, both the Robins pastors, family, we have to run for them, and don't drop the baton. So hoist up your, sh your gym shorts, tighten your shoes tight, and give it your best. Thank you. to say it again. Good morning. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Scripture reading of God's Word today is Ecclesiastics 12, 9, 12, 9 through 14. <clears throat> Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people he pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like God's. They collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in additional to them, or making many books, <coughs> of making many books, there is no end and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. 
there is the <coughs> conclusion, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hitting thing, whether it is good or evil. So be it. join me when in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the privilege to come and worship you freely. We thank you for your word that we have in so many forms and ways, Lord. We thank you that your word is true, that it doesn't change, that you are the one, if we seek you, we can find you because you want to be found by us. We thank you for calling us out of the darkness into the light. Fill us with your spirit today, Lord, that we may see your truth and apply it to our lives and live an obedient life. Run this race well. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that one day we will spend an eternity with you because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. So I've entitled this Wisdom and Justice because we're reading along in um, Job and we'll be reading Proverbs and such. And don't you hate people that have a bigger story than what you've got? You know, they've got to top your story. You know, like Mark and Diana need prayer mercies to go to Oregon. We're going to Florida with four grandchildren. Come on. <laughs> so I feel like Job this week. I do. This has been a tough week. Sherry's had to go to Spokane back and forth two different times because of some ongoing problems with Kira that we don't know why they're there. And there's a problem possibly even with besides health safety. So we decided to, instead of taking two grandkids cross-country, two three-year-olds, to take a three-year-old, a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old. Forty hours one way. Well, you're not going to be bored. You know what? I'm actually looking at this as being a rest. <laughs> because this week has been trying. I feel like Job as I'm reading all this. And I want to say to you right now, I don't want to hear you don't have time to read your Bible. Don't want to hear it at all. Because like I said, we had work, we had Awanas, we've got church, we've got everything going on. And I don't know when I read my Bible this week, but I read this week's and next week's this week. I'm not bragging, I'm telling you I did, because I have a responsibility to you. And God spoke to me through it. I knew that I was going to miss one Sunday, but I might be missing two, just so you know. Because it's 40 hours one way, I think I've already said that. But if I haven't, it's 40 hours one way driving time not stopping to go to the bathroom. And if one of them says they have to go to the bathroom, they all have to go to the bathroom, whether they do or not. But you've got to try to take them because you're trying to potty train the three-year-olds. Oh, This week we didn't leave the shop. We slept on cots at the shop because we had all the kids. And then Sherry would take off to the hospital and come back. We don't know the test yet from Kira. But like I said, we decided to take her out of this situation with what's going on with, with uh Michaela's father and everything. It would make it easier on them. It would get Kira out of the situation. So pray for all that. But I have felt like Job this week. Have you ever had those weeks? I know you have. I know we all have. We sinned against God Almighty and deserve to be punished eternally forever and ever, to never see the goodness of His grace upon grace upon grace. But because of Jesus Christ, you experience His grace every day in the midst of suffering. Amen? You should have read Job chapter 20 through 35. You should have read 1 Corinthians 7, 20 through chapter 11. Next week, you should read Job 38 through the end. You should read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through the end and Proverbs 1 to 8. I got a lot to cover today. Okay. Wisdom. What is Wisdom. We expect wisdom to be something we gain with time, but if you don't seek God, you're not going to gain wisdom with time. You're just going to continue in what you think is wisdom, which is your folly, your foolishness. Because wisdom of God is the message of the cross. It is the power that saves you. Does your life live the message of the cross? 
Wisdom can be a noun or an adjective. In the Greek, in the New Testament, the, the noun is Sophia, and the adjective is Sophos. And I probably didn't pronounce it right, but I tried. 1 Corinthians 1.19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom, Sophia, of the wise, Sophos. The, intelligent of the, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. We think we're so wise. We think we've got it all figured out. We think we get up by our might and set our plans for today when we have no idea what God has planned or what life will throw at us because we live in a fallen creation. For it is written, comes from Isaiah 29, 14, which we've already read Isaiah, which was warning after warning after warning to God's children to turn, to repent and turn from their ways and to turn to God, and He would take them in His arms and take care of every need they had. But they were a stiff-necked, rebellious people. So, so much of Isaiah is filled with prophecy of the one man who would come, who would live a righteous life, and who would lay down his life as a ransom for yours. And his name is Jesus. So I have to ask myself, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the verse prior to 1.19, says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Am I living or am I dying? But to us who are being saved, that's where I'm at, it's the power of God. So I'm going to live by the message of the cross. I am going to preach the message of the cross in joy and happiness, in sadness and in suffering. I'm going to preach the message of the cross. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. So where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the the world through the, its wisdom did not know Him. But God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Because of Jesus Christ, I can know the mysteries of God. I can know His eternal plan of salvation. I can ask Him and search for wisdom and He will grant it to me. Not earthly wisdom, not the things that I think are wise and the things to do, but His wisdom. Are you saved? Are you growing in your faith and in your wisdom? It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. You should be praying for more faith. The disciples asked to have their faith increased. And you should be praying for more wisdom. Wisdom to face all these things in life that you don't know how to face. That you want to take in your own control and own power. And you want to do the things that you can do. I cannot protect care. I cannot provide my family safe travel to Florida and back. I cannot do those things. I cannot provide them an income tomorrow because I don't know that I can wake up tomorrow and have my faculties or wake up at all. It is by God's grace that we have each and every minute so we need to live our lives for Him by the message of the cross which is the power that saves us. The rest of what we go through in life that we think is so important may just be foolishness. You also read James in James 1 chapter 2 verse 8. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. There you go who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So you can't say it's not for you, it's for somebody else, it's for all. But, verse 6, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. In the Old Testament in Hebrew, the noun word for wisdom is hakmah. And the adjective is hakam. We find it first used in Exodus 20, verse 3. This is the NIV. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. Do you remember that? You read that not long ago. All of these gifts that the Holy Spirit gave these rebellious children in Israel that kept saying, we want to go back to Egypt to where we were enslaved. But God called them out so that they would worship and praise Him and offer sacrifices to Him because He was going to take them to the promised land. Well, the King James Version in this case 
says it much better in my opinion. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, hakam, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, hakmah, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me the priest's office. And Peter says we are priests, family of God, a royal priesthood building on the cornerstone, which is Christ Jesus himself. We all have different gifts from the Spirit. We have different jobs, but we all build together upon Jesus Christ, the message of the cross. This wisdom comes from God. It makes us wise-hearted, for He fills us with the Spirit of wisdom that you cannot have without the Holy Spirit, so that you can be a minister, so that you can serve, offering the, the spiritual sacrifices that a priest is supposed to offer, drawing people to God. All the way up through Exodus 35, you see this constantly in, the, in how the people gave, or God gave wisdom so that the people could build the tabernacle, so they could build the, do the things of the priest uniforms and so forth. And then in Exodus 35, you can't say it's just for those, again, who are in positions in the church. Here's what the King James says in Exodus 35. And they came, both men and women, this is the entire congregation, the body of Christ, Israel, as many as were willing-hearted. And they brought bracelets, earrings, rings, and tablets, all jewels of gold. And every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. And every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins, they brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the, brought the Lord's offering. And every man with whom was was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. Verse 25 of Exodus 35. And all the women, so we can't not include the women here either, guys. All the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which had been spun both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen, giving it all to God. I already told you we read before how much was given, all the pounds of gold and silver and brass and everything else. All of this given because God first gave to them. They didn't consider things their own. Oh, that sounds like the New Testament church in Acts, doesn't it? That, each, that some people even sold property so that none were in need. Giving what you have to God because wisdom and justice go hand in hand. Just like hearing and obeying. If you have wisdom, you want to bring out God's justice in this world and forevermore. Verse 26, And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. If only they would have kept seeking God's wisdom, God's given wisdom to them, maybe they would have entered the promised land. Revelation 2, verses 3 to three through 5, Jesus says to the church, He said, You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you first had. I'm sure the Egyptian, I mean the Israelites were so excited when they saw the water stand up and they walked through on dry ground and God rescued them, but it was just no time after that when they mumbled and grumbled and complained. We have to seek God's wisdom every day. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. We have to spend time together using the gifts that the Spirit has given us, realizing that we are to live as foreigners and aliens in this world, and we have a message to present to this world. It is the message of the cross. Because there are little boys and girls and old men and women and everyone else that needs the love of Jesus Christ because without it they will die eternally and never enter the promised land. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. It's the cycle of human history. It's mankind. Oh, what a wretched man that I am without the love of Jesus Christ living in and through me. Jesus' words are to the church there. They're given as, a, as an inspiration to John because he has been suffering so much and he's longing for Jesus' return. And he doesn't know what to tell the church that's being persecuted. But it's the same message. 
Hold firm in your faith. Live a holy life. Be obedient to God, which you never could do before. But now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you let the Spirit transform you, you can live like Jesus in this world. You can go from your born-again state to a state of maturity, of completion. God said in Exodus 20, verse 5, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Sounds just like what Jesus was repeating here. He's jealous for your love. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Every time I read that, I think, I don't hate you, Lord. But what is the opposite of love? Am I madly, infatuatingly in love with God because of the love He gave for me? Or do I longingly look at other things, other gods, other idols, instead of my God who gave His one and only Son for me? I'll remind you again, James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. I don't know about you, but I need to do that more than what I do. Because so many times I try to take things into my own hand, by my own might. I don't think I have time to read God's Word today, anything else. Well, he woke me up several times at 2 a.m. and I couldn't go back to sleep. By 3 a.m. I grabbed my phone because I got my Bible right there and I started reading with babies and cots all around me. And I got two weeks worth done. So that's why I said, I'll say again, you can get it done. And then I'd go back to sleep, sleep another couple hours, and then I'd wake up and couldn't sleep again. So I started texting Sherry sermon notes. And then I put them all together. And the sermon didn't get to, written until 4 p.m. yesterday. But it's pretty good. <laughs> he gives you what you need when you need it. He takes care of you, and he wants to give you so much more for all eternity. Job. <laughs> tough. It's tough to see that. But it's not to see what we deserve. When you see the self-righteousness and arrogance, even in Job, who is a righteous man, I see the self-centeredness, the self-righteousness in myself. I see how stiff-necked I am. We read about all the good advice that Job's friends gave him. They came there to comfort him. Corinthians says that we know God's comfort so we can comfort others. That's what we're supposed to do. They came to comfort him, but instead they pointed fingers. You've sinned. Just go, go repent. You've sinned. And Job kept saying, no, I haven't. Oh, but yes, I have. No matter how righteous I think I am, right there I'm just sinning. I'm starting to sin because of my pride. Job's reply was he was righteous upon righteous upon righteous. But we read in Romans, For all have sinned, Romans 3.23, and fall short of God's glory. Oh, thank goodness for Jesus Christ. Because verse 24 says, And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And then if you keep on reading in the first part of 27, it says, Where then is your boasting? Job was starting to boast. He was a righteous man. He was a godly man. We read how he, he sacrificed in case his children had sinned. He cared about them. He wrote down on his doorpost. He talked about them when he got up. He, he, and he was from the land of Uz. He wasn't from the nation of Israel. But he cared about it. And he was as righteous as righteousness can be on your own account. But it's still filthy rags, isn't it? Job says in Job 12, verses 12 and 13, Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? Not necessarily, does it? Verse 13, To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are His. So you have to seek Him, and you will find Him. You have to ask. You have to seek. You have to knock. Isn't that what Jesus said? And it's a continual asking. Asking, asking, seeking, 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 and knocking, knocking, knocking until the door is open and it's given unto you. Oh, but Jesus had to say to the churches again, Behold, I stand at the door. And, or he said that he's at the door and knocks. Well, what's Revelation 3.20? I'm drawing a blank. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, will let me come in. I will 
eat and partake with them. Sorry, I know I butchered it. I don't have it in front of me. But Jesus is standing there, sitting there knocking, asking you to let him back in because you've fallen out of love with him. We think we're wise, but are we really foolish? Are we obeying the message of the cross? Job chapter 20. The wise, or let's call this foolish counsel, and Job's wise or maybe foolish defense continues. Then in chapter 28, there's an interlude. Did you get to that? There's a pause in all this that's going on. In the interlude, you see some things like this. There is a mine for silver, this is verse 1, in a place where gold is refined. Men, verse 10, they tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all of its treasures. Verse 11, they search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to life. But where can wisdom be found? Verse 12, where does understanding dwell? Verse 13, no mortal comprehends its worth. No mortal comprehends how valuable wisdom is. It cannot be found in the land of the living. Verse 20, where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? Verse 23, God understands the way to it and He alone knows where it dwells. The fact that God even grants you wisdom when you, act, when you ask is incredible. That He'll make His plans known to you. The redemption of mankind, all mankind that continues to sin and sin and sin no matter how dep depraved they are or how self-righteous they are. Man continues to sin and sin and sin against God, but if you ask Him, He will give you wisdom if you believe. To know His plans so that you can live out His plans and live a life that brings justice and equality. Verse 27, then he looked at wisdom and he appraised it. He confirmed it and tested it. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil, to change the way you live, to live differently, is understanding. Because once you have wisdom, you have to understand and put it into practice. And that means you have to bring about justice and equality in the world. It's one of the things I love about the free Methodists. They seek to be, be, bring people equity and justice in this world. And we don't even know about some of the things going on in other parts of the country, but thank goodness our denomination, again, is all over the world. And they fight the injustice that's out there in slavery and whatever the, 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 the issue is. This upcoming week, you're supposed to continue on from Job 38 to the end, so I'm going to give you some spoiler alerts here. You're supposed to read Proverbs also. We just read Job 28, that interlude. Proverbs 8. Let's see what Proverbs 8 says. Does not wisdom call out? Wow. Not only does God say that if you ask Him, He will give it to you, but He's calling out to you, wisdom is. Come. Partake in the wisdom of God so that you can live a life of worth. Does not understanding raise her voice? I'm dropping down to verse 29 now in Proverbs 8. When he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was constantly at his side, wisdom. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessings are the, blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. All who hate me love death. The words from Solomon written so many years later that echo the words of Job and the trials and sufferings that he's going through, which you and I go through also, but probably not to the point of Job. And we all want to say, why, Lord, what have I done wrong? When we don't know what the suffering will bring that will bring about patience and prove our faith. After the interlude in Job comes his final defense in chapters 29 to 31. 
Job starts off, well, kind of like the church in Ephesus, Ephesus. The first few verses are about God. But then it goes to me, myself, and I. Let me, let me stand back here and tell you what I've done for you, Lord. <laughs> what could I ever do for you, Lord? What could I do? Except lay prostrate, prostrate. <laughs> I know, I just do that to aggravate you. <laughs> to lie flat on the floor. And call out to God in His mercy and grace to forgive such a sinner as I. And then He says, you're forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Come here, my child. Wow. Wow. In Job 29, verse 18, I thought, I will die in my own house. My days are numerous as the grains of sand. <laughs> I've thought that before. Who knows where I'll die? Who knows when I'll die? In James chapter 4, verse 13, Now listen, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Kind of puts it into perspective. Then the words of wisdom come from a young man. They should have came from the elderly, right? But sometimes our, our, us elderly and even more elderly don't always have the words of wisdom that we should. And we certainly shouldn't be condemning a brother or sister. But they come from an, a younger man, Elihu. And they are words that God does not condemn him for. In fact, it's implied that the Spirit of God gives him these words. He says in Job 32, 7 through 9, I thought age should speak. Advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the Spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. There's your wisdom and your understanding. It is not only the old who are wise, not only the aged who understand what is right. Wisdom that God gives even to a young person who is in love with him, who seeks him, who finds him, that is still madly in love with that first love in their life. They have not departed from it. In Job 35, then Elihu said, Do you think this is just? You say, I am in the right, not God. Yet you ask him, What profit is it to me, and what do I gain by not sinning? I would like to reply to you and to your to to you and to your friends with you. Look up at the heavens and see, gaze at the clouds so high above. If you sin, how does that affect God? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? That God would want me in a relationship with Him is beyond anything I can fathom. And that He would give His Son to die for me to establish that relationship is beyond that. For I am a created being that rebelled against God and continue to rebel against God even after I've received His grace. Oh God, You are so great, so merciful, so kind. Verse 8, your wickedness only affects humans like yourself and your righteousness only other people. So how can I do anything but live my life the best that I can? And I can't, so I've got to rely on God. I've got to ask. I've got to seek. I've got to knock. knock. I've got to seek wisdom because she's calling out to me so that I can be wise, so that I can live wisely, not my own wisdom, but God's wisdom, so that I can bring about justice in this world, so that I can show others Jesus Christ. By thinking of others more highly than myself, by laying down my life to save one someone else. Is that how you think about your salvation? Jesus said to love others, and in the church in Corinth, Paul is trying to show them the most excellent way. Another spoiler alert, you're going to get to that. He says, you're seeking all these gifts and everything, but you forgot the most excellent way. If you do all these things without, without love, you're simply a noise. And you've gained nothing in this life, in this world. Is that how I'm living my life? <clears throat> You'll begin reading Job's reply. 
in chapter 38 and 39. Chapter 38, verse 2, he says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? We think we're so smart and we live in a world far more than what the church in Corinth was with all their wisdom and everything. Look at all the technology and wisdom that we have now and look at what our kids use as idols. All the wisdom of this world. They can't do without it. Verse 3, brace yourselves like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me, which I cannot. And he goes on to say, where were you? Who marked off? Have you ever? Have you comprehended? Do you know? Do you count? Can you hold? Can you trust? Do you give? Do you make? Does the hawk and the eagle, were they created by you and do they answer at your command? Do you see them when they're in the wilderness flying? Do you feed them? When we see an eagle soar in the sky, well, oh, wow, look, there's an eagle. How majestic. Job 38, verse 36. Who gives the abyss wisdom or who gives the rooster understanding? <laughs> that ought to sum it up. <laughs> I didn't even know a rooster had understanding. Did you? That ought to sum it up. There are even references to dinosaurs and dragons or sea monsters and you know every country has legends of dragons and stuff and the descriptions are right there in Job and we've got the fossil record for, for dinosaurs and stuff and we have footprints of human beings walking beside of them just to say that too they weren't millions of years before here's the ending of Job I know this is 42 verse 2 I know that you can do all things no purpose of yours can be thwarted you ask who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge Surely I have spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. But yet when you ask for wisdom, God gives it. You won't know everything, but you'll know enough to live wisely and justly in this world and draw others to Jesus Christ. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you, you sh and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Jesus, 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 thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. I will deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after you. But you need to give me the wisdom to do that, the power to do that each and every day. So I fix my eyes on you, the author and perfecter of my faith. Help me finish this race marked out before me. Help me to run with perseverance with those that I am running with till we see the other side. In 1 Chronicles 29, I know you're not reading that yet. If you want to read it, you can for homework. David prays for wisdom for Solomon who becomes the wisest man in all of the earth, the richest man. And he writes those words that says, listen to wisdom. Listen to wisdom. Don't chase after the things of the world because they're meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. March 15th devotional says, when we think about God's rescue mission, which ultimately culminated in the cross, we ought not to see it as something supplied in a moment of crisis, whether we should, rather we should see the cross as grounded in the eternal mind of God, who had determined from all eternity to call a people to Himself through Jesus and to restore under Him everything that was spoiled by the fall. The motivation in God's eternal plan was not only a desire to make men and women happy, although men and women do become ultimately happy as a result, but it was a concern for His name, for His glory, that we may be called out of the land of Egypt so that we may worship Him and then go to the promised land. Thus God's eternal plan of redemption is about Him rather than all about us. Let me read that one again, okay? Thus God's eternal plan of redemption is all about Him rather than all about us. It concerns us, it transforms us, but it's all about God until the gospel moves us to praise Him and live for Him, we have not properly understood it. 
we don't have understanding, do we? Because we've not asked God for wisdom about how He wants us to live in this world to bring Him glory and honor. 1 Peter 1, 3-5 says, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in His great mercy He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. That's what you and I are part of. That's what will be revealed to those who fight this fight, who finish this race, who don't turn back, who are firmly grounded and don't go adrift. First Peter continues in verse 6, In all this you should greatly rejoice, greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. You love Him. You love Him. And <clears throat> even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Is the message of the cross what you live by? Is it wisdom for you? Or is it foolishness? Proverbs is another book of poetry and wisdom like Job. The purpose of Proverbs is stated right in the beginning. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 1, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right, just, and fair. Did you catch all that? For gaining wisdom, for knowing wisdom, to become intimate with wisdom, and instruction, telling us what we're supposed to do. Instructions given to you and I. That means discipline, correction, training, so that you can go and live the right way. For understanding words of insight, literally it means to understand the words of understanding. For receiving, that's not something you do yourself, that's given to you. Instruction, which is doctrine, correction, discipline again. To send you to the right behavior, what you do with the wisdom that has been given you by God to live for Him. That is what prudent behavior is. It is doing what is right, what is just, what is fair. So can you really, based off that, can you really live like a Christian and do nothing to fight for justice and equality in this world? Oh, yeah, you can pray. You can do that. But are you doing other things? James says when somebody comes by and says they're in need and you say you'll pray for them, what good was that? You've got to do something. Verse 3 has four different parts. Receiving what God has given you. Wisdom is calling out to you. Will you receive it? Or will you deny it and blow it away? For receiving it. Because first you've got to receive it so that you have prudent behavior. What is wise behavior based on your understanding? Behavior, what you do with it. What is right, what is just, what is fair. In all aspects of how you live. Okay, I can just think of some things right off that I wasn't right, just, fair about probably yesterday. Okay? To know so that I know wisdom. To instruct me how to live justly. So where do I begin? Just drop down a few verses. We've already read it in Job in the epilogue. Verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Holy fear. Trying to grasp who God is and who I am in comparison to this so that I can live for His will and for His might rather than my own. Trying to get a grasp of it at all and asking Him for more wisdom so that I can grasp it more, so that maybe I can see in this suffering, maybe this could be the outcome. I don't know, but I'll be obedient. Because who would have ever thought that Jesus, not uttering a word against those because He was being falsely accused, would die for me and that would be the salvation for my soul. 
Humanity yelled at him in their wisdom, Come down off that cross if you're who you say you are. Prove it to us. But what if he did? We would be forever damned for all eternity without hope, without love, without joy, without anything that comes from God. But he loved us, and even when we were enemies, Christ died for us. So how can we say that Scripture doesn't point to Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus, to Jesus? And are you living for Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus? Wisdom means loving your enemies, thinking of others more than yourself, not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to, fighting injustice and living with equity to bring up the poor and the needy. You think they're going to be poor and needy in heaven? Why should there be poor and needy here? Why should there be people, people that don't have rights that are enslaved and everything if we can do something about it? If you can't do anything about it, then pray, 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 believing. Proverbs tells us that there are many benefits of seeking wisdom and to seek her at all costs. And to pass this wisdom on to our children. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 talk about that seeking so much and abstaining from an adulterous woman. Where are we getting to, off into that right in the beginning of Proverbs? Was adultery such a big sin that it had to be mentioned right here? Maybe. But how about our adulterous heart that wants to chase after other gods instead of after God Himself? What about that Jesus had to say, this I hold against you, you've fallen out of love with me. Are you wholeheartedly like Caleb was in all of his wisdom at 80 years old and entered in the promised land? Are you wholeheartedly in love with God, especially for what He's done for you through Christ Jesus, your Lord? Proverbs 7, 24 to 27. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Don't let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Wisdom is compared to a woman, and foolishness is compared to you following an adulterous woman. Because any time you turn your, way, your heart away from God, you're following another God, and He is a jealous God who longs for you so much that He would give His one and only Son's life for you. Do not stray into her past. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Are you going to follow after wisdom and the message of the cross? Or are you going to be an adulterous fool and follow the ways of this world? We've been sanctified, made holy, called out to be a holy people, priests for God, offering spiritual sacrifices that are holy and acceptable unto God, and this is your reasonable and prudent means of worship. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God living in and through us. In Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom calls to all of those who will listen to her and follow. Does wisdom not call out? Does understanding not raise her voice? At the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance she cries aloud. Beside the gates leading into the city, there will be a new Jerusalem, won't there? A new heaven and new earth. She cries aloud. To you, O people, I call out, I raise my voice to all mankind. You are, who are simple, gain prudence. You who, are foolish, you who are foolish, set your hearts on it. And at the end of chapter 8, For those who find me, find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. All who hate me, Love, death. Death or life. Jesus or rejecting Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you confessing Him today? Does your life prove it? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. For you are a mighty, 
awesome, loving God. Your ways are far beyond our ways. And who are we to ever question you? That you would give us your love is amazing. And the fact that we rebelled and sinned against you. And the cost, and you knew this from the beginning of time as we can comprehend it, was to lay down your son's life as a ransom for ours. We are purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, made holy, spotless, and white by His robes of righteousness, not ours, that we may be a people that proclaim Your glory, Your honor, that we worship You with our lives, offering our lives up in exchange, best that we can for what Jesus Christ has done for us. Oh God, fill us with Your Spirit. Help us to walk in step with Your Spirit. When you call out to us with wisdom and when the Spirit calls out to us, however, Lord, and gives us the gifts that we have, help us to not to pass them by, but to be looking for them, to be asking, to be seeking, to be knocking. And Lord, when you give those things, help us to use them to bring about your glory and wisdom and honor. And we put our children and our grandchildren and our friends, we put their souls into your hand because we know that you work out things for your glory and for your honor. We will trust in you, Lord, so increase our faith day by day by day, second by second by second. Bind us together, Lord, that we are a people that serve you. May this church reach out to, the, their, to this community and beyond, Lord, as Jesus Christ hands and feet in this world. We thank you and praise you for the fact that Jesus became flesh and blood and dwelt among us. We thank you that he said he would not orphan us, but instead sent the Spirit to reside with us, God living in us. Prick our hearts today, Lord, so that we live more for you than we did yesterday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.